Hello everyone. Once again, this is Pastor Terry Reese of the Valley Grace Brethren Church of Armagh, Pennsylvania. And as always, it is indeed a great privilege to be with you for this time of study and reflection. And we are continuing in our series on the four states of man. And uh, it is indeed our privilege to be talking about the final state of redeemed man, the state of glory, what we call our glorification. Uh, it has also been referred to as the state of consummate happiness. This is the grand uh, consummation of our salvation experience in Christ. Uh, it is the end goal for which uh, God has prepared for the elect. And uh, we, uh, as we think about our salvation in Christ, uh, let us remind ourselves that our salvation is unto the glory of God. Even as our present existence, as 1 Corinthians 10.31 reminds us, uh, even as our present existence is to glorify God in all things, um, so too is our future existence. Um, we should not be thinking of heaven uh, in mundane terms. Uh, we should not be thinking of it as an, an eternal snooze fest, as a retirement community, as a country club, as a long-lasting backyard barbecue. Uh, the fact is, our salvation is indeed under the glory of God. I think about that uh, astonishing first chapter of Ephesians, um, where the Apostle Paul, in one long Greek sentence, which uh, covers verses 3 th through 14, all those verses are actually one sentence in the original, we see Paul praising the triune God. Um, in verse 6, he praises uh, God the Father. It is under the praise of his glory that we are redeemed the one who chose us in him, the one who predestined us. And uh, it is unto the glory of God the Son, unto the eternal praise of his glory, uh, verse 12, that uh, uh, we are redeemed. Uh, he is the one who uh, took upon himself human flesh, became incarnate for us sinners and for our redemption. And it is unto the praise of the Holy Spirit, in verse 14, the one who drew us on the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, uh, that we are redeemed. And, uh, you know, when we think about uh, our eternal destiny, what exciting things God has in mind for us. We should not think of this as some eternal retirement community where we simply lay on a cloud for the next trillion years and do nothing. Uh, the fact is, uh, really, our lives will just be beginning. Um, think about how God will renew us, how he will expand our minds, how our hearts will be purified, how our physical natures will be redeemed, uh, the, uh, the corruptible will uh, be put off, and we will put on the incorruptible. God is not doing these things for no reason. It is unto his glory and we will be able to serve him all the better. And indeed, we should think of heaven in those terms. Uh, doesn't Revelation 22, when it speaks of the new heaven and the new earth, uh, uh, say that his bond slaves will serve him? Verse 3. Um, we, uh, we think about why man was uh, created in the beginning, uh, God's purposes in these things, uh, uh, we see in Genesis 1, verses 26 and 28, man being given dominion over the, uh, the physical creation. Man was created as God's image bearer. He is unique among the life forms of this earth in that he, was, uh, he is the image bearer of Almighty God. He reflects uh, uh, God's personal and spiritual characteristics. And a man was given uh, stewardship over the physical creation. And even uh, after the fall, uh, we see in Genesis 9, a, uh, a, uh, no, um, the descendants of Noah uh, being given uh, dominion over the physical creation. But uh, we as God's image bearers uh, will be uh, 
reflecting the image and likeness of Christ in the way that we should in our redeemed and glorified state. So uh, let's not think of heaven as a boring place, as a mundane place, as a, a Indeed, as I said before, an eternal retirement community where we lay around and do nothing except maybe strum a harp once in a while. That really is not what the salvation of God is about. You know, last time we began discussing this, uh, this matter of our glorification, we, uh, we defined the doctrine of glorification. We uh, said it is the, uh, the final uh, stage of our uh, of our redemption experience, we uh, sometimes called ultimate sanctification. Indeed, we will be made entirely holy. Um, we, uh, as we, uh, we think about uh, this matter of glorification, I just want to quickly re, uh, remind you of our, some of the things we said when we defined the term. It uh, deals with the ultimate perfection of the believer. It is his final condition. It is uh, the consummation of our salvation. It is when we inherit our fixed, imperishable, perfected state. Uh, again, 1 Corinthians 15, verse, uh, verse 53, Paul says, For this perishable must put on the imperishable. This mortal must put on immortality. Um, the uh, when we think about this uh, this state of glory, um, let's remind ourselves that even now, as redeemed believers in the state of begun recovery, the state the regenerate state, we are still plagued with the old sin nature. But uh, with this final uh, stage of our salvation, we will be uh, purged of our sin natures. So we will be changed into holy immortals, and we will enjoy direct and unhindered access unto God's presence. So much of what we're talking about here with regard to this state of glory, uh, it has to do with perfected communion with God, uh, the experience of the beatific vision. Again, I remind you of our Lord's words in Matthew 5, verse 8, on the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And uh, also Revelation 22, verses 3 and 4, there will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Again, this uh, when we speak of heaven, uh, how dare we uh, think in mundane terms? And uh, I've already mentioned this. This is why these a lot of these contemporary Christian books, these bestsellers, uh, are so offensive to me. Like uh, this, heaven is for real, and ninety minutes in heaven. Uh, all these things diminish what heaven is really about. What uh, the state of glory is really about. Well, this week, I, uh, I just want to build on some of the things that we talked about last week. If you want a fuller definition as to the glorified state, I would invite you to turn to our previous message on YouTube or on Internet Archive. But uh, as far as the timing of this event, uh, we're speaking here in terms of the, uh, the rapture of the church when uh, our salvation experience will be fully consummated. Uh, we're not going to get into the intermediate state, the state that uh, believers enjoy today when they go to heaven, when their soul spirit goes to heaven at the point of death. Uh, we're talking here about uh, when our bodies are ultimately resurrected and uh, rejoin our soul spirits. Uh, you know, death, death is the violent tearing away of the soul spirit from the body. Um, with our, with uh, the state of consummate glory, however, we will see our, 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 um, our soul spirit purged of the sin nature, joining a, a glorious, resurrected, imperishable body. 
This happens at the rapture, uh, the last trumpet uh, discussed in 1 Thessalonians 4 and also 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 53, where we read, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and the mortal must put on immortality. And again, then, uh, this is discussed in 1 Thessalonians 4, where the uh, Apostle Paul is bringing reassurance to a church that had certain confused uh, views on this uh, subject matter. And Paul makes it clear that the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who remain and together will join with the Lord in the air, and so we'll ever be with him. And Paul tells them, uh, draw comfort from these words. And I trust that is your comfort. That is our great hope, the resurrection. Now, today I just want to talk about how this, uh, this is a doctrine that indeed requires written, special revelation from God. Uh, I'm talking about the Word of God, that uh, sure word of uh, prophecy. You know, this, this doctrine, as you see it uh, being apprehended by uh, various pagans that uh, Paul was preaching to, it... it it was conceived by many of them as a great absurdity. This idea that a dead body could one day rise up and live again. You know, the, uh, the ancient Greeks, of course, the apostles were uh, witnessing in the uh, Greco-Roman world. The ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans... Uh, you know, they had this tendency, because of their, uh, the teachings of their great philosophers, to, uh, to view the body, the physical body, as uh, a prison house of the soul. Um, who wants to be bodily resurrected anyway? Wouldn't it be better to uh, be liberated from uh, the stinky old body, uh, uh, to have the freedom of a uh, uh, disembodied spirit? Um, and, of course, uh, the ancient pagan world was also uh, attracted to this idea of the transmigration of souls. Uh, this was known in the uh, Greco-Roman world, the Stoic philosophers, uh, and uh, also, of course, in the Far East. Uh, the ancient Hindu uh, religion uh, and the Hindu philosophers taught this idea that um, the body would be uh, continually reincarnated in various, or excuse me, the soul would continually be reincarnated in various bodies. Uh, uh, the body was destroyed after death. Uh, of course, this was associated with their uh, theological understanding of what happens to the soul spirit after death. Uh, the uh, the uh, there was no expectation that your soul would return to your old body. Instead, you would be reincarnated in a different body. Uh, of course, if you lived a particularly wicked life, you would be incarnated as some lower life form, perhaps a vegetable, or perhaps as a rabbit whose destiny was to be uh, torn to pieces by wild animals. Um, all of this has to do with the law of karma, and it also has to do with the pagan conception of what God is. God is the world soul, and your little, your individual soul is a little chunk of that that uh, can, uh, that uh, continually is reincarnated until such time as you uh, you are fit to rejoin the divine. The Buddhist religion, its concept of salvation is nirvana. The idea that your individual soul is a, like a drop of water whose destiny is to experience uh, personal annihilation. The drop of water rejoins the great ocean of the impersonal world soul. They see salvation 
as personal extinction. Kind of ironic, the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, they see uh, damnation as personal extinction. They believe in annihilationism. But, um, the, uh, but the thing is, the, the ancient pagans had, uh, saw this whole notion of the, uh, the body, your physical body, coming back as something absurd, something uh, uh, that isn't even desirable. Um, you know, they, they often had no difficulty with this idea of the immortality of the soul. I mean, the soul, you know, that's something that is immaterial. Uh, we can see how that, uh, how that could uh, continue on. But the body, you know, there's nothing the, in terms of empirical evidence, that is what our eyes can see, that would suggest that a dead body could uh, rise again. Um, this is just not uh, something that is automatically intuitive. Uh, far from it. Um, something dies, it, return, it's, uh, it returns to the earth, and it decays and dissolves into dust. Uh, what in that suggests resurrection? And so this was indeed a, a great absurdity uh, to the, uh, the world that was destitute of divine revelation, I'm speaking of the heathen world, unlike the Jewish world, which did have uh, the benefit of divine revelation. But uh, think about some of the encounters that the, uh, the Apostle Paul had with the heathen world. Um, Acts 17, for example. You'll remember that uh, great uh, chapter that where uh, it's a fascinating chapter where this representative of the God of Israel, the Apostle Paul, is on Mars Hill, the very center of Grecian learning and wisdom in Athens, uh, the city that uh, had Athena as its patron goddess, Athena, the goddess of wisdom. And he is preaching unto the Epicureans and unto the Stoics, two rival schools of Grecian philosophy. And we read in Acts 17, 18, when Paul begins preaching, quote, some of the uh, Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Stop there. You know, it's not even clear if they understood what the meaning of the term resurrection meant. Some uh, commentators say perhaps they thought that was the name of some sort of goddess or something, or some sort of god. Um, but um, when we get down to verses 31 and 32, Paul starts talking about the world being judged by a resurrected man who was once dead, he says, uh, verse 31, because he, he, God, has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead, unquote. Verse 32, you see the reaction of the philosophers. Quote, now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Others said, we will hear you again about this, unquote. So uh, the God, the Holy Spirit, was working in the hearts of some, but uh, others, you see the natural intuitive reaction here. This is an absurdity. The body, the physical body rising from the dead and some dead person uh, coming back and judging the world? I've heard enough. <laughs> and uh, you think uh, also about uh, Acts chapter 26, uh, verse 24. Uh, the context here is uh, the Apostle Paul uh, had been granted audience to the young uh, Jewish king, a young man of the Herodian dynasty uh, named Agrippa and his uh, sister Bernice, and unto the Roman governor Portius Festus. Now, uh, this governor Festus was uh, a sagacious politician and a, uh, a reasonable type of individual in the sense that he was a dignified Roman statesman and an efficient administrator. Uh, but um, Paul begins uh, 
his defense as to why he's in trouble with the Jews. And he, he mentions uh, the resurrection uh, uh, in uh, verses 6 through 8. And then uh, again, uh, he, uh, uh, towards the end of his discourse, he begins talking about the resurrection of Christ. And Governor Festus, up to this point, had been sitting there, listening quietly, no comment. But then finally, with this, this final reference to res physical resurrection, in essence, he, he loses it. And we read this, verse 24. While Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. Unquote. Don't you like that, that reaction? Um, Festus literally loses it. Paul, you're nuts. You're talking about dead people now coming up out of the earth. You know, you've just been reading too many of these old dusty Jewish parchments and, uh, you know, they've, it's had an effect on your mind. It's warped your brilliant mind. Wake up! That is the, the voice of the sophisticated Roman, the, the rationalist, the student of philosophy. He just, uh, he just can't handle this. Of course, uh, you know, when you think about uh, this matter of bodily resurrection, I'm sure it's just as weird, just as strange to the rationalist of our own day. Um, dead bodies rising up. What is this, Frankenstein or some kind of zombie movie? Um, how is this even possible? I mean, the body decays. It turns to dust. How can you even isolate the individual molecules of your body as they're recycled in the earth and become uh, parts, perhaps, of other forms? Uh, um, what about those that die at sea? How, how does this work, that God's going to actually raise your body, not just some physical form, but your body, your individual body, you know, you die at sea. They, as they say, the sea is very kind to her dead, meaning you don't see decaying bones very long at sea. I mean, go ahead. Uh, take a uh, submarine down to or, uh, or bathosphere or one of these devices down to where the, uh, the wreckage of the Titanic is. Uh, enter the grand ballroom in your diver's suit. You will find no bones. At all. This vessel went down over a hundred years ago. Um, there's nothing there. The, uh, between the ocean saliency, uh, you know, your, your, and uh, the, the creatures that are down there, there is, uh, there's nothing left of, uh, recognizably of the forms of those who perished in that, uh, that awful disaster of over a century ago. Uh, various creatures have uh, probably ingested the molecules of these, uh, of these, th those that perished. And uh, how in the world is God going to be able to reconstitute any of your molecules and uh, raise up a body that died at sea? It's just preposterous, or so it would seem to us. But friends, if we have special revelation and we have the Word of God, we don't need to worry about the details. How's God going to do it? I don't understand the physics of it. We don't need to worry about any of that. All we need to, know, need to do is believe the Bible. Revelation chapter 20, verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. End of story. That's all I need to know. Do you need to know anything else? If God said it, it's going to happen. I don't need to know the specifics as to how he's going to do it. You know, I, I'm just not that smart. Uh, but I know that God is that smart. He's omniscient and he's omnipotent and he's omnipresent and he can do these things. And he will, because he said he will. End of story. Um, 
this uh, this uh, matter of the resur bodily resurrection of the dead uh, in these uh, passages uh, where Paul is uh, uh, defending himself, whether it be before the Sanhedrin in Acts 23 or 6, or whether it be uh, uh, in Act, his defense in uh, Acts 24, uh, 15, or whether it be in Acts 26, verses 6 to 8. Uh, he, he describes the bodily resurrection of the dead as, quote, the hope. That's the hope of the Jewish world. The Jewish world, unlike the, uh, the heathen world, uh, had, uh, had special revelation, written special revelation from God, prophecy from God. And uh, so this, was, uh, this matter of the bodily resurrection was no mystery unto the Hebrew people. Um, think about uh, some of these Old Testament passages, just give you a couple. Daniel 12 verses 2 and 3. Prophet Daniel says, uh, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awaken, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Those who have insight will shine brightly, like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. But those who lead the many, uh, and those who lead the many to righteousness, like the stars forever and ever. Interesting. Daniel speaks of the bodily resurrection of both the righteous and uh, the unrighteous. Um, this uh, later in the New Testament, uh, we'll see Jesus discussing this in John chapter five, verses twenty-five through twenty-nine. Uh, listen to these words from our Lord. He says, "Truly, truly." By the way, when he uses that truly, truly, that's a double emphasis. That's, that's kind of the exclamation point in the Jewish world. Um, listen, listen, this is vital, vital. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so, he gave to the even so he gave to the son also to have life in himself, and he gave him authority to execute judgment, because he is the son of man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice, and will come forth. Those who did the good to the resurrection of life, and those who committed the evil to a resurrection of judgment, unquote. So there will be a resurrection for all, uh, the state of glory, the uh, state of consummate happiness, uh, the first resurrection for the righteous, but there will also be a bodily resurrection for the damned. You notice those who appear at the great white throne judgment of Revelation chapter 20, they will stand. This is an inference as to they, they will be standing in a resurrected bodily form. And, uh, but these folks, uh, the, this is the, uh, they await the second death. Um, they, were not, they did not die in Christ, and uh, unfortunately their immortal form will, will experience eternal torment in the lake of fire. Their undying forms will experience nothing but consummate misery. And this is the end of the road for those who are uh, who die in a state of sin. The, uh, we think also, going back to, to the, uh, the Old Testament in terms of its proclamation of the, uh, the bodily resurrection, think about Isaiah 26, 19. A very explicit reference to the bodily resurrection. Your dead shall live their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. For your dew is a dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. It doesn't get much more explicit than that. The dead shall live, their bodies, note that, their physical bodies shall rise. This isn't just some spiritual 
resurrection. This is a physical bodily resurrection. Their own bodies shall rise. They will rise from the dust. And you know, uh, this was the great uh, expectation even um, for the very ancients, those of the patriarchal era. I think about uh, the expectation that that ancient man Job had. You know, in Job chapter 19, uh, Job speaks about his future hope. Now, Job, uh, his faith wavers as he's dealing with this torment that he's experiencing. He's in the spiritual depths, and yet sometimes his, uh, his faith recovers. And this is a brilliant example of this. In Job chapter 19, verses 25 through 27, you have an, an extraordinary testimony. And I remind you, this is a man who was probably a contemporary of Abraham, a righteous Gentile, um, a, a man who lived uh, either before the formation of the Hebrew nation or just uh, or when the Hebrew people were in its infancy in patriarchal times. Um, so this is a very ancient man whose bones by now have rotted up. But he says this, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. Now, what an extraordinary passage. You think about the things that this ancient man knew, this ancient man who knew about the Proto-Evangelium of Genesis 3.15, where there was that first reference to the coming Messiah who would be born of a woman and who would crush the head of the serpent. The Proto-Evangelium, the first preaching of the gospel in the Garden of Eden by God. Uh, he, he addresses the serpent and says that the seed of the woman would crush his head. But Job knew that a Redeemer was coming. A Messianic Redeemer was coming. I know that my Redeemer lives. And Job also knew that in the latter day he would be standing upon the earth. Of course, we think about uh, the Lord Jesus Christ of his second coming, Zechariah 14, his feet will touch the Mount of Olives. He's coming back physically in a resurrected glorified body, which is in the likeness of the form that we shall have. But uh, Job professes that even though, yes, he knew that his skin would be destroyed, and that he would rot in the ground, nonetheless, in his flesh, he would see God. He was expecting the beatific vision in his own flesh, and uh, his eyes, he would see these things, his eyes, I and not another. You know, there would be this identification with, uh, there would be a continuity, should we, uh, shall we say, between this old, the old form and the new form. And, uh, you know, this, this is an extraordinary passage, Job 19, verses 25 through 27, but it demonstrates that uh, hope for the bodily resurrection, that was the hope even for the most ancient believers. And uh, we... Uh, of course, in the New Testament, we have much clearer revelation of these things, particularly in the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah, we think about uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the great sign that he gave, the sign of Jonah, that uh, even as uh, Jonah was in three days in the, the belly of the fish or the, or the sea monster and then emerged, uh, so too would the Son of Man spend three days in the, the heart of the earth, but then rise again, bodily rise again, Matthew 12, verses 39 through 40. And, uh, you know, this, uh, this is the hope for the, uh, the New Testament uh, believer. We will be uh, raised in the likeness of the resurrected Christ. This is our glorification. Uh, Jesus is the forerunner for those who are redeemed, Hebrews 6.20, and he is the first fruits 
of those who are redeemed. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 20. First fruits was a Hebrew festival, which uh, was a, uh, uh, it, it spoke of the, uh, it was the first fruits uh, in promise of a greater harvest to come. And so too is the, uh, the bodily resurrection of the glorified Christ. He is the first fruits, and as there is a first fruits, there will be a greater harvest to come. We too will be raised, just as 1 Thessalonians 4 promises us uh, that the dead in Christ will rise, and then we who remain who are in Christ, and we will all meet the Lord in the air in our glorified, resurrected form, a form that is like his. Um, in Philippians 3, verses 20 through 21, we read, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Or again, think of 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. You know, it's a small wonder then that this is this bodily resurrection is referred to as the hope, our hope. You know, First Thessalonians chapter four, verses thirteen, fourteen speaks of it in those terms, and. Uh, Yes, when we, uh, a loved one dies, we grieve, but we do not grieve as those who do not have the hope, this hope. This is the hope, the bodily resurrection, uh, the state of glory. Well, friends, next time we're going to uh, take up uh, some of the particulars with regard to this matter of the uh, the bodily resurrection, uh, what, what sort of experience should we uh, come to expect? What light has God's word shed upon these, these matters? Uh, a fascinating study. So we'll look forward to seeing you next time. And until next time, this is Pastor Terry Reese. May the Lord be with you.